cleared my throat and forgot I wasn't on mute. Sorry. <laughs> okay. Thankfully, I hadn't started the recording yet, but I'm going to do that here <laughs> just now. <laughs> yep. Good morning, everyone, by the way. Glad to have you all here. Today. Good morning, everyone. <laughs> Good morning and welcome. My name is Cornelia Stevens. I'm the Executive Director of Top Ready Learning Centers, and I want to welcome you to the April meeting of the Kansas Early Childhood Recommendations Panel. Uh, this is a remote meeting, and today's meeting materials are posted on the panel meetings webpage on the Kansas Children's Cabinet website, which is kschildrenscabinet.org. Panel members will clearly identify themselves when they begin speaking and can also use the raise hand feature to show that they're ready to share if you have any comments, questions, updates, or anything like that. That's helpful just so that we don't miss anybody that has any information they would like to share. For today's agenda, we have our welcome. We will then approve the April agenda. Uh, we will approve the March meeting minutes that have been sent out. Uh, we don't have anybody today for the Kansas Open Forum, but I will give um, some guidance for anyone interested in speaking to the panel. We'll hear about the Family Wellbeing Measure Tool, updates on the Child Care Family Needs and Preference Study. Uh, work groups will have an, uh, an opportunity to share any updates on their All In for Kansas Kids Tactic Work Group. We will talk about the 2425 panel applications, bright spots. So um, panel members, please start thinking about any bright spots happening within your organization, your community, or just information that you'd like to share. We'll discuss upcoming meetings, and then we will adjourn and break out into our work groups. First thing on our agenda is to approve the April agenda. So panel members, again, clearly identify yourself when you make your motions. Uh, but first, uh, may I have a motion to approve the April agenda as presented by Ms. Lindsay? This is Maritas. I move to approve the April agenda. Perfect, may I have a second? This is this Natalie is McLean, I'll second. Great. All those in favor, thumbs up. Any opposed, same sign. Perfect. The March minutes were sent out. Hopefully all of us have had an opportunity to review the minutes. If there are no revisions, may I have a motion to approve the March minutes? This is Tanya Kane. I approve the minutes. Perfect. May I have a second? This is Karen McCrory. I second the minutes. Okay. All those in favor, thumbs up or raise your hands or whichever feature you would like to use. Perfect. Perfect. So we, as I mentioned, we do not have anybody um, slated to speak on, a, I'm sorry. Okay, I saw th thumbs up and things going or whatever I got to study this. So we do not have any bodies later to speak today on the Kansas Open Forum. But if you are watching live stream, um, Kansans are encouraged to submit comments through the Kansas Open Forum, Forum Comments Form by five o'clock the day preceding each meeting. And that's in order for you to share written comments or sign up to share verbal comments with the panel during this portion of the meeting. So you have, if you have anything that's happening within your community, within your organization, ideas of things that we need to focus on as a community, we would love to be able to hear from you. So please, again, go to the Kansas Open Forum Comment Form, which is on the Kansas Children's cabinet website. We would love to hear from you. For our first presentation, we're going to hear about the Family Wellbeing Measure Tool, and we have Jared and Kayla from KUCPPR. Good morning, everyone. Uh, thank you for uh, having us join our the slide. Yeah, thank you so much. Uh, so thank you for having uh, us join today uh, in your conversation on this panel. Um, we were we're we've been invited and asked to discuss um, how we have developed a new comprehensive measure of family well-being uh, that we are referring to as the the family well-being survey. Uh, my name is Jared Barton. Um, I am an assistant director leading uh, applied research efforts at the University of Kansas and the, the Center for Public Partnerships and Research. So uh, Kayla and I are both um, at CPPR. 
Um, one of the the kind of a, the big uh, one of the big initiatives that we've been working on and supporting over the last few years now um, is a federally funded initiative that's been funded through a, a family um, strengthening and primary prevention uh, federal funds that, that have come down. So we are trying to expand universal supports for strong and thriving families. And specifically we're, we're targeting an area in an eight county area in Southeast Kansas. Um, we refer to this initiative as Family Strong for short. And part of Family Strong um, involves the development of well-being measures or measures of well-being so that we can start be, like begin to like kind of better understand when um, improvements have been made in family well-being uh, across a number of different concepts and ideas and, and kind of uh, uh, key domain areas. We'll, we'll get into all that here in a bit, but trying to give you just a, a little bit of a background to it. Um, in Southeast Kansas, we Family Strong is, is, a, is what's known as a demonstration project. So we've essentially designed a, a collection of interventions to happen in Southeast Kansas. Um, and we're implementing those for the first time, um, or at least like expanding some of them uh, if we're not implementing for the first time. And then we're trying to kind of like uh, assess, evaluate the impact of this demonstration. And, and so one of the ways that we're trying to, to assess and measure the impact of these different uh, strategies and interventions in Southeast Kansas is through developing this well-being tool that we're going to get into. Um, Primarily what we're, we're focusing on in Southeast Kansas is kind of like four uh, different intervention areas. So first, our first strategy is that we are looking to expand uh, preventative legal services for families that might be experiencing um, um, uh, like concerns around the social determinants of health. So trying to expand like affordable, free, uh, universal, accessible legal services to, to families in the area. Um, the second strategy that we're implementing in the area is the expansion of the, the, the Family Response Advocates Program, which is overseen by the Family Resource Center uh, in Southeast Kansas. And what the Family Response Advocates do, for those of you that may not be aware, is that, you know, they're, they're, they're basically like community um, social workers or community um, service providers who often act as kind of like the first um, uh, the first phases of the, the service uh, array or the service field in Southeast Kansas that families might, might come to. It's viewed, um, you know, it's outside of child welfare, it's outside of certain um, uh, mental health or health services. So oftentimes, like what we're seeing in Southeast Kansas is that um, folks will will take up services at the Family Resource Center where they won't take they won't necessarily take them up other places because they view the Family Resource Center as a more kind of universal place for receiving those services and accessing those services or at least getting connected to them. So like kind of facilitating um, uh, case management or referral connections in the community. So it's, it's expanding upon the family response advocates. Um, the third thing that Family Strong is doing is expanding the provider support network in, in the community. So Southeast Kansas, for those of you who are aware, has always had kind of a strong um, early childhood uh, referral network and has implemented IRIS and expanded over time, but we are um, using IRIS among other referral strategies, uh, integrating legal services and FRA uh, family response advocate services into that network to kind of expand it as, as well. So looking at the expansion of the, the support network and the provider network across the area. Uh, and then the fourth thing that Family Strong is doing is looking at um, um, like kind of like a grassroots uh, public campaign that focuses on uh, help seeking in, in the community. So trying to get out word about um, the expansion of these services, that they are universal, that help seeking is a universal um, uh, behavior that, that everyone may need um, seek and uh, help uh, from time to time. So really trying to, again, kind of use this collection of these, these four strategies in combination to um, improve well-being in, in this area and demonstrate well-being in this area of the state. Uh, so this is the kind of the the call for why we're here today is developing out this tool and developing out this instrument so that we can begin to, to assess if there's actual improvements in well-being in the area. Um, so for today's conversation, I'm planning to cover kind of four main objectives. One, the need for this well-being tool. 
um, the theoret to the theoretical frameworks informing the development of this tool. So it's it is pretty theoretically driven, and and I think um, it's it's unique in the sense that it's combined some theoretical frameworks. We want to show you how we develop that, uh, and then. For the, the last couple parts of this, we'll talk about how we actually developed this well-being survey and then show you just a, a couple snapshots of what the well-being survey looks like so you can get a sense of what, what it actually what it actually is. Uh, so next slide, please. So you'll see, you know, um, uh, several things on these next few screens. We're actually got kind of giving this to you as a takeaway message. So it's it's meant to give you as much information as as possible uh, and a, a, day, a document kind of for takeaway. Um, so you'll see, like, um, we're starting with how we've identified some needs in the gaps in the the the, the surveying or the assessing of well-being across. Um, across the, the literature and what we were seeking out or what we were finding rather when we we're trying to seek out if there were existing tools that might be in place or things that we could use to measure this uh, and what we were seeing the needs were. So in terms of our work with Family Strong with this federal initiation and federal demonstration in Southeast Kansas, what we were in need of was first a, a comprehensive cross-sector assessment to a, a, a evaluate family well-being. So we wanted to you know, not just have something that would focus only on employment or economic outcomes or education outcomes or health outcomes. We needed something that would um, really comprehensively look at all the different areas that might affect an individual, a family, or a community's well-being, and we needed a tool that could look at all of those. Uh, second, we wanted to um, have the tool be served as like the, the basis for a broader um, understanding of community well-being. So this tool is an individual tool. We would be asking individual people to assess their own kind of like personal well-being or how they feel about their family's well-being. But the idea is to kind of roll it up at multiple levels and kind of aggregate the data at the individual level, obviously, to be able to say something about what a community's overall well-being may look like as well. So we wanted something that we felt like could, you know, not just be used to assess one individual person's um, uh, in addition to being able to assess one individual person's uh, sense of their own well-being, we wanted to be able to kind of roll it up and say something about a community scale. Um, we also wanted to um, enhance our understanding of the, the underlying like factors or what drives health and well-being so that we could help target policy and systems change. So again, we are trying to take kind of like a multi-system view of this and make sure that this is informative of like transforming systems, transforming policy, um, in addition to being able to assess where um, a particular family may have strengths or areas where services could, could support them. Uh, and then finally, and I've already kind of mentioned this, we wanted it to be theoretically grounded. Uh, so we wanted to kind of like capture a full range of family experiences. We wanted to capture a full range of systems um, uh, and, and factor like perfective, protective factors and multiple concepts. So we really had to rely on theory and not just our kind of like preconceived ideas about what well-being means uh, based on what we know. So we, we really wanted to drive this with theory. Uh, in terms of gaps, um, you know, we wanted to start from a place of, are there things that are out there? We wanted to assess whether or not there would be um, uh, tools that could, could fill some of these needs. Uh, and as we did our review, we, we noticed a number of gaps. So existing gaps in well-being measures um, are, are primarily what you see on the screen there. First and foremost, well-being tools or tools that um, you know maybe are framed as measuring well-being, they tend to focus pretty heavily on one or two areas specifically. I mentioned this just a bit ago, but a lot of times, for instance, it looks at like employment or economic or financial security. And while that's an important factor of, of someone's well-being, it's not the exclusive focus. So we wanted things to be more comprehensive, more uh, well-rounded or, or um, more holistic rather in terms of what um, what different factors and domains might affect an individual or a family's well-being. So not just focusing on one area was a really important uh, gap that we found. Uh, second, 
Um, and kind of going along with this is that they often overlook other critical factors around uh, things like social support on uh, affecting someone's well-being, um, the access to education or the access to health care, um, what the community looks like, what the neighborhoods look like, just kind of having all of those, again, different systems, different areas, different sectors that might uh, impact an individual or a family's well-being. Um, they were often overlooked in what we looked at in the measures and in focus in favor of something more focused on economic and financial well-being typically. Uh, and then finally, they all tend to lack an examination of structural uh, inequities and they 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 favor and they prioritize um, an individual strengths or deficits. So you know kind of what we mean by this is um, you know you can ask good individual questions about like do you have enough education? Do you have enough employment? And kind of get at that idea of, of if an individual has a strength or a weakness or a deficit in a particular area. But it's also important to understand you know, is there is there actual equitable access to things in a given community? Are there opportunities in a community uh, that that may may or may not be present that that could facilitate or, or hinder someone or an entire group of folks from being able to um, improve well-being or or achieve um, a level of of well-being that they would aspire to? So based on, um, yeah, you can advance next slide. Thanks. Uh, so based on these needs, uh, these gaps, what we identified, um, we turned toward the development of our own well-being survey. So this is a new survey that we've put together. Um, it's what we're rolling out for the first time with Family Strong. Um, we're also trying to, to roll it out on a larger scale with some other initiatives that are going on in Kansas to get more of a, a, a larger statewide um, focus on it. And then also additional grantees that have received these federal funds in other states are, are uh, looking into what we've been doing and adopting it as well. So there's at least one other state in uh, Ohio right now that is that is in the process of implementing this well, as well. So um, kind of having some similar experiences across the country of folks um, not finding the right measures and needing to develop their own. So we're, we're excited about opportunities here in Kansas uh, to develop some of these things out. Um, as I mentioned, we had a critical need for this survey being theoretically grounded. We didn't just want to lean into our own understanding of what well-being means, given that well-being is multidimensional. Uh, it, it's, it crosses systems, it crosses structural levels. Um, all of those things can have an impact on individuals and families. Uh, so we decided that we would look at multiple theoretical frameworks to help us develop out what this survey would ultimately be. Uh, so you can see we've relied on, on five frameworks. Uh, you might all be familiar with some of these or all of these, um, but specifically we looked at um, integrating Maslow's hierarchy of needs. So that's the first one that we have listed there. And that's what that kind of pyramid there, uh, for those of you that are familiar or not familiar, that, that, that triangle there that has the different kind of um, levels of what human needs may be, or theoretically what human needs may be. A lot of times, things tend to focus on the base of that pyramid. Do we have physiolo our physiological or physical needs met? Do we have our safety needs met? Um, when at the end of the day, um, having a full sense of well-being, a full sense of, of self, you know, has to work kind of up, up that pyramid. You have to have a feeling of belonging. You have to have a feeling that you can um, achieve something, have some confidence, have some self-esteem. Uh, so we wanted to make sure that our tool reflected that. And you're going to see what uh, I'm going to explain really clearly, I think, when uh, we get to the tool itself, like kind of how we integrated this. So it's um, the idea being, you know, ultimately, if you've got a scale of one to five, and one is the worst score and five is the best score, that oftentimes we see five is almost just kind of good enough. Like five would be my need, my, my physiological or my safety needs are met, met. And what we're trying to do with this survey is actually push towards something better and push towards higher parts of that pyramid, if that makes sense. So we really wanted to be intentional about five is not, is, is not the baseline of well-being, uh, uh, Safety or physiological needs being met is not the baseline of well-being. You know, that would be more like a three, the middle part of the scale. And as we move, move toward a five, we're moving towards more abundance, more um, opportunity, uh, more, more like feeling more senses of thriving. Uh, so, so many tools that exist don't have that kind of framing. So we're trying to be intentional about that. Um, we integrated uh, elements of the strengths perspective and the protective factors um, uh, framework as well. 
Um, um, so it is uh, intended to be kind of a strengths-based um, view, uh, even though we're trying to implement some of these structural factors. So I want to kind of give a nod to that. Uh, but the other two things that I want to focus on are the social determinants of health framework and the systems theory framework, which again, you, you can see on the screen, we provided some quick visuals for that. So the social determinants of health framework is probably the most like um, present, like kind of concrete thing that you'll see in this well-being survey. And the reason for that is that we actually structured our questions and our items around these five areas that you see in the social determinants of health framework. So when it comes down to it, we had to figure out if we're going to make a holistic, like kind of comprehensive um, well-being survey, what are the areas that we think round it all out? And the social determinants of health framework is what is what we decided to use. So that means you're going to see a series of questions around economic stability. You're going to see a series of questions around education and access to, to quality education. You'll see a series of questions that relate to the neighborhood and built environment, the social and community context. So that's, again, that's why you're, it, it's the, the social determinants of health framework is very present and I think very uh, obvious within this uh, well-being survey and, and why we wanted to give you this visual here so that you would know um, how we mapped it the way that we did. Uh, and then finally, the, the systems theory or the social ecological uh, framework, if that's something you all are fam familiar with, um, is this, this third visual with these kind of intersecting concentric circles, overlapping circles here, um, to just kind of describe and show that, you know, uh, an individual is within multiple systems and um, all of those systems impact the individual and the individual shapes and influences those systems as well. So again, kind of a nod toward that idea that most existing tools and the gaps that we discovered focus pretty heavily on like an individual's um, placement within a system, not considering some of the multi-system, multi-structural um, effects or, or impacts that other systems might have on well-being. <clears throat> Next slide, please. <clears throat> so in terms of the, developing the survey itself, um, for the structure of the survey, we did, you know, like I said, we did a big review and we we checked out other tools that might exist that might be out there. Um, and we did find some strengths in some of the existing tools that were already out there that, that we integrated along with these theoretical frameworks to build our own. Um, so, <clears throat> excuse me, some of you might be familiar in your, in your practice or your work with some of the tools that we have on the screen. So hopefully you can kind of see how we reflected these in the, the survey that we developed, um, but specifically, we uh, leverage the strengths of the North Carolina Family Assessment Scale or the, the NICFAS, I've heard it referred to uh, by some that have used it. And this scale um, is really kind of what gave us the idea of, of what I mentioned earlier about like establishing, um, you know, your the low end of your scale and the high end of your scale as moving towards something that's improvement or moving towards something that's like more uh, uh, scarcity um, lacking in an area and using the center kind of as the basis, like the standard of there being uh, a sense, a sense of well-being or a sense of like, you know, a, 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 um, something being kind of what we would say at, at a baseline is like good enough. And then as you're moving toward the higher end of the scale that you're actually moving toward improvement. So that, that scale helped us kind of situate that. The Arizona family self-sufficiency matrix um, is a tool that, um, we, we we considered quite a bit, but is one of the tools that focuses pretty exclusively on self-sufficiency and, and kind of economic stability. But what was valuable about it, and as you'll see when we get into our tool, is that it doesn't just say one is strongly disagree and five is strongly agree. It actually defines, you know, when you rate yourself a one, it means dot, 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 dot. Like it's, it's more narrative based and it, it helps the participant kind of actually think about um, where I would position myself within the tool. So it's it's not just a traditional scale of one to five. It is a scale of one to five, but then when you're at, when you, when you rate yourself a one, you rate yourself a two or a three, it's actually defined what those things mean. And I think that was really helpful in shaping what we did with our tool. Uh, and then third, we uh, relied on the protective factors survey, mostly because we we have a protective factors framework that's helped uh, influence what we've done with well-being. There are, there are elements of well-being in the protective factors framework, uh, but it also has 
a version that does a retrospective design. So basically, you know, instead of taking it at pre-test and then taking it again at post-test, it just does it at the end and it asks the participant to think back, like think back before services, think back a year ago. Um, how would you rate yourself now, uh, knowing now what you what you didn't know a year ago? How would you rate yourself now? And then how would you how would you have rated yourself a year ago? Uh, and the benefit of that is really that it gives it it, it reduces data burden actually because uh, you're not collecting data at multiple time points. But the real benefit of it is that it, it actually kind of helps us understand if we're having people overrate themselves at, at baseline, which tends to be a thing that happens in the research world. We call it a ceiling effect, where somebody uh, before they did a program or did an intervention didn't know what they didn't know, and they rated themselves higher than they they may have had they learned more skills, changed their minds about certain things, or started in implementing new behaviors. So retrospective designs helped us. Um, so with that, our, our tool ended up having several unique features. It was situated within that social determinants of health framework that I shared with you on the last slide. Um, again, it, it is a five point scale. So you're going to see that when we get into this uh, tool itself. But three, we use three as a midpoint for establishing a baseline of well-being. This is probably the biggest thing that I'll, I'll say multiple times. When you answer a three, we wanted it to have some sense that if I can say that I'm a three, that I have some sense of well-being and that as you answer four or answer five, you're actually moving toward improved well-being. We didn't just want to say five is the standard. If I'm at five, things are good enough. We want to kind of push for for, for better. We want to push for, for actual um, uh, a higher standard of well-being. And so we were very intentional about that when we built this. Um, uh, and then finally, it's it's both retrospective. It's retrospective in nature, so we're asking people to think back to a time before uh, and rate themselves. Of you know, now that you know what you know, how would you rate yourself your well being before a year ago? How would you rate yourself knowing now uh, what, what you think your well being was about a year ago? Um, and then finally, we've designed it so that it can capture both the perspectives of a provider and individual perspectives. So at the end, you know, if you're a service provider and you work with a client for six months or 12 months or however long you might work with them, we feel like there's a lot of insight from that provider's perspective as well. So we want to hear how a provider would rate their client's improvements in well-being and kind of triangulate that or corroborate that with how an individual views their well-being as well. So trying to get at multiple perspectives on well-being. Next slide, please. Um, I think uh, in terms of uh, this one, this slide I could be relatively brief on um, the process for for developing this tool. We tried really, really hard to not just you know do this from our offices, from from the university. We developed a lot of uh, you know we got the initial things uh, developed. We did a review of the existing tools that were out there and the ones that we talked about. We, we took those tools to our partners as well and kind of talked about those tools with them and if they they fit or if they were holistic enough. Um, ultimately, um, you know, kind of the key point here is that we, we're, we're, we're doing what we call kind of validation and validity studies on this tool as the part of like a co-developing, co-creating process with our partners. So what that that really looks like in practice is that we have a steering committee that oversees this particular initiative, and that steering committee has been a part of the, the full development of this tool. We've taken it to the steering committee multiple times. Um, our, our steering committee is comprised of um, uh, providers in the community, but also individuals with lived experience actually accessing services in the community or individuals that might have experience with the child welfare uh, system in the community. So getting actual um, <clears throat> um, feedback uh, and, and kind of buy-in from our partners has been important. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, we partnered with Ohio State University, who's also um, evaluating a similar project in Ohio. Uh, and then we've been working with our federal uh, partners and our, our technical assistance providers along the way. I think the biggest thing is support from our, our steering committee and our community partners. Um, the ongoing work with this, you know, this is a, a new uh, survey. We're rolling it out for the first time uh, starting in May. Uh, we're going to collect initial data sets. We're going to pilot this. Um, I've talked a lot about Family Strong, but we're also going to be implementing this with some of our, our Family First. If you're familiar with Family First, some of our Family First programming in Kansas. 
um, family resource centers. So I talked about the family response advocates, the family resource centers that uh, at least in Southeast Kansas have overseen those programs. Those are expanding throughout the state and we're gonna be rolling uh, this survey out with, with those implementations as well. So trying to get uh, a, a cast a wider net to see if this is, um, we can collect enough tool to, data to determine if this tool is um, what we believe it can be. Okay, next slide. So this will be just, this is um, for like the sake of time, I'm, I've just kind of taken out two snapshots of the tool itself. Uh, and we can share a copy of the tool um, after this, this presentation so that you can see all the different areas. So like I said, we have the five areas around that social determinants of health framework. And each one of those areas is gonna have a snapshot or a series of items um, that correspond to it. So I've given you kind of two areas that are um, uh, intentionally gave you these two areas because one, I told you that economic well-being is the focus of a lot of the existing tools that are out there. So I want you to see how we implemented that focus area in this survey itself. And then two, showing you the, the neighborhood and built environment uh, questions. Uh, because that's a that's a part of the social determinants of health framework that we saw lacking in a lot of the tools that existed. So kind of trying to show you how um, we're we're holistically rounding things out. I also think these two are a good snapshot because one is kind of more focused on like what an individual's problems may be, whereas the other one shows you that um, gives you more of that like kind of context or idea around the community, like what is the accessibility of things in a, in a community for me or for people like me. Uh, so when we look at the economic well-being questions, um, the first thing I want to like just uh, call attention to again is this is on a scale of one to five, but we are rooting three as our baseline standard uh, of well-being. So when I answer three to the employment question, I'm saying I am employed and my pay and benefits are adequate. It's just a level of, it's a level of well-being. It's what we're saying is a standard. There's obviously room for improvement to just say that my pay and benefits are adequate, but we feel like at a baseline, um, it's fair to say if someone can say I'm employed and my pay and benefits are adequate, then they can have a standard of well-being. As you move up from three, then you're seeing how we're filling that in more. We're moving toward more of uh, more opportunity, more uh, opportunities for uh, jobs, more opportunity for for benefits. Just like you know, kind of moving toward a place of I have additional abundance. What's different about this? is you don't tend to see scales move that way. Where what we have defined the three as, you would typically see that being your five and things just get worse from, from that point down. So there's not really room for us to understand if improvements are happening. And ultimately what we wanna do with these kinds of projects is push systems to be better, push communities to be better, push policy to be better. And so we, we need to start building tools that actually encourage an understanding of moving moving up and having that upward trend. So the the, the key you know kind of key thing that that people point out and notice and and we agree and it's intentional is that we don't necessarily expect that people are going to go from a one to a five or a three to a five from from pre to post. This is actually intended. We expect and suspect that we're going to see lower scores on this, and I think that that's okay. Um, because it gives us an opportunity to advocate and start uh, using data to push for improvements. So um, again, just kind of want to call that out. It's very intentional that we think, you know, if, if someone answers a three, that's good for now. And that helps us understand where we can improve. If someone answers lower than a three, um, that might also be expected and, and kind of moving the needle here over time is, is going to be, you know, a longer arc. It's not just saying, Hey, everybody answered a five. Cool. We're doing what we needed to. It's actually meant to, it's meant to be, um, let's have a realistic picture so that we can, we can advocate for better. So again, as you move up from three, I'm employed and my pay and benefits are adequate. You'll see um, I have moving up to a four, I have stable employment with adequate pay and benefits and I have opportunities for advancement. So again, giving you an additional opportunity, moving towards something that's more abundance, uh, all the way up to five of 
I have stable employment with adequate pay and benefits. If I needed to find a new job, I have many options. So it's, again, it's showing somebody's like, it has a good standard of well-being. And if they needed more, they wanted something different, they actually have those opportunities. They might exist in their system. They might exist in their community. So this is our way of kind of pushing the, the boundary here from, I have a good enough job to, I have a good enough job and I feel secure and confident enough that I could, that I could get an equivalent or better job if I needed to. And also I have many options, which is intended to say something about the system. There's enough here. There's an abundance here that I'm actually not worried about it. Um, whereas the 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 other direction of this, as you move down, I'm employed, but my pay and benefits aren't adequate. So I've got a job, but I need better, or I need uh, uh, additional benefits or additional pay. All the way down to I'm not currently working because I I struggle to find job opportunities where I live. So again, it's it's kind of pulling the individuals. Um, it's 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 helping us understand what an individual's given status is while also putting some responsibility on the system by the individual being able to define that um, I'm struggling with opportunities, whether that's a systemic opportunity problem or they have an education need or they have a training need or, you know, what, whatever that looks like. Um, it's still giving the individual a little bit of say of saying like there's there there are multiple factors that are influencing why why I don't work. Um, and then you'll see kind of on the, the right hand side, there's boxes for this time last year as of today. And that's why that's the retrospective nature of this. So assigning how I feel about my uh, employment opportunities today versus this time last year. And that helps us kind of understand if there have been improvements in their well-being um, over the course of a year. Uh, we, this is, you know, you're seeing this kind of linear on a more of a paper version here on the screen. We have this built into a web interface that like the, the drop downs and kind of what drives you and the workflow through this, um, is a little bit easier, would be a little bit easier to navigate, um, on a screen, on a website, for instance, versus what you see on the screen. But I will say we've, we've like piloted this with a small group of about 30 people because we were concerned about readability, length, how would people be able to understand a retrospective version of it? And we actually were uh, expecting um, um, more uh, constructive like criticism of it than we received. People actually worked through it pretty well. Um, we got specific feedback from our lives from someone who is a lived experience representative of our steering committee that was basically like, I love this uh, survey and how it was designed because I feel like some the way it's written, I feel like it means somebody's going to look at it and actually hear what what I have to say instead of me just saying one, two, five. Um, it seems like it was thought through uh, and it seems like it's it's something that might actually be useful that we can we can have conversations about. So that was a that was encouraging feedback. Um, so again, you know, I won't go through each one of these individually. Um, I know I spent a lot of time in that first one, but the same concept kind of applies when you look at regular income and food. I have regular income. That's enough to meet my family's needs. I have regular access to a variety of quality food. So, you know, when we're looking at food, it's not like I've got my fridge full. I have access to, I have regular access to a variety of quality food. Again, that's, that's what we believe should be the standard. If you're going to be an average well-being, you should have regular access to quality food um, versus, you know, I can I can put food on the table, which is what you would tend to see as a, as a standard, and we don't we don't view that as good enough. Um, so that's that's how we designed it and why we designed it this way. Uh, and then moving into the the neighborhood and built environment, <clears throat> again, I won't spend. I, I know I'm running short on time here soon, so I won't spend too much time digging into this. But this is meant to um, to show again about like opportunities and access to to housing, um, as you'll see in the uh, full survey as you take a look at it, like, you know, housing, for instance, there's multiple things, there's quality, there's safety, there's, there's um, affordability of housing. So we had to be pretty intentional about like, not loading a certain concept too many places. So affordable housing is a concept that you might see in like an economic well being area, whereas housing quality is looking at your neighborhood and your built environment. So just kind of keep, keep that in mind, that um, there's all sorts of even kind of like sub factors that might influence how somebody feels about their well-being in a given area. Housing is is one of those. Uh, when it comes to housing quality, 
We're talking at a at a base here in the middle at three. Most housing in my neighborhood meets livable standards, and we've defined livable livable standards through what uh, Housing and Urban Development Department defines as decent, safe, and sanitary. So by being able to say that most housing in my neighborhood meets these standards, you're able to say something about the system or the, the community or the structural things that are going on in your neighborhood. And then moving up toward, you know, um, assessments of the livability and the quality of the housing. So all housing meets livable, you know, going from most housing meets livable standards to all housing meets livable standards to all housing exceeds these standards, like just like great you know, exceptional housing in my neighborhood. Um, and as you move down, you know, less and less abundance of quality housing or more sc scarcity of quality housing. Uh, and again, trying to, to our best to do what we can to kind of pull the individual out of this by, or for an individual having to say like, I've got crummy, terrible housing to uh, my community, my neighborhood has limited access to this and, and, and pulling that out from like an individual's uh, um, strengths or deficits in an area toward a, a more structural, um, equitable view of, of what this could look like. So looking looking at the time, I uh, I know that I th this is like uh, my time is up. So I'm going to pause here. This was my last slide. And like I said, I'll I'll follow up um with the the full survey if people are interested in taking a look at that this gives you just a, a bit of a snapshot and i know it's a, a lot of information it's an overview and background of what we did here um like i said we'll be rolling this out in three major initiatives in kansas uh the federal our federal partners are are obviously very interested in this this is an innovative um uh an innovative project overall in the country and um, these tools don't exist. And this is a, a big opportunity, I think, for our state to be leaders in this area. And it's it's been great and exciting to work with the steering committee on it. Um, are there any, I don't know if we have time for it or not, are there any questions or comments, Fernando? Can we take those if needed? Jared, this is Tanya Kane with Child Care of Kansas. First of all, I'd like to say this is amazing uh, tool that you guys have put together. We have several projects that work on the two gen approach with um, the Ascend Aspen Institute. Um, I'm not sure if you're familiar with them, but this survey seems to encompass a lot of what their approach uh, circles around. Mm -hmm. So I'm excited to see when it would be available more broadly for projects like that, that we use in Kansas and our organization even uses to be able to implement within those projects. Cause I'm really excited to see how much of this kind of is the same approach that they use it, which is a national Institute. Um, and when we're working with their projects, so good kudos to you guys. It's a great survey that I think will tell us lots as we move forward in Kansas. Well, thank you so much. That's uh, I, I, honestly, I, I'm going to pass that along to the team. This has been a challenging project to um, to implement, and there's been a, a lot that's that a lot of heart really uh, and energy that's gone into this. So that's an, that's encouraging to hear. I really appreciate that. Um, I will say too that we. When I say we're doing, we're rolling this out across the state as part of, of three initiatives, this is actually going to be a very wide net. It's not just for people that are participating in these programs. This is going to be kind of blasted out to the full community and it will be open and live for any anyone to do it. So while that doesn't necessarily like tailor it to the program that you're speaking to, I do think if, if, um, this is something that that folks are excited about and this group's excited about and you want to just um, want us to be able to kind of expand it more. If you start seeing some of our uh, materials come out and you start seeing QR codes, seeing links, this is going to be open and live for anybody in Kansas to, to do this survey. So I would en encourage you to do it, encourage you to try to implement it in your practice, get a hold of us and see how we can um, uh, perhaps like uh, drill into things for you if that's possible. Uh, but there will be a, a very large net that's cast um, with this survey and it will be open to anyone to take. Thank you for that. We'll watch for it. Yeah.
Um, next slide has uh, my contact information. Well, the 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 full team here. So um, I have the, the I I have the privilege of being able to present this work, but this has been um, you know the 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 work uh, the hard work of about five or six people that you can see there on the screen. In addition to our steering committee that that um, has comprised about twenty to thirty people over the course of the development of this, and and um, lots of lots of partners. Um, and in addition to these groups that are inviting us to share about it. So um, feel free to, to reach out to me um, um, and I'll, I'll stay uh, connected with this group and, and share additional uh, information and, and the full survey pretty soon. We can we can roll this out. I would say, that, you know, whatever I share is a draft. I wouldn't necessarily recommend putting it into your practice if you like it yet, but that will be very, very soon. So let's let's be in touch if it's something that you would like to use. Uh, just so we can we can let you know um, if we've got newer versions or different things have rolled out or different resources to help you with. Uh, for the time being, you see that Family Strong logo that's there on the screen. If you start seeing things in your communities that have that logo on it or have a well-being survey link on it or a QR code on it, that's that's kind of your cue or the indication from us that we are are rolling the survey out statewide and um, you know take it uh yourselves um and 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 rate it for yourself or or try to um spread it along if you'd help with that that'd be terrific and we will yeah thank you so much we will continue to to let you all know the developments of this um as we begin launch so thank you all thank you jared i am um just like tanya i'm very interested in uh, seeing the full version and I'm excited to, uh, you know, have this rolled out. We have many families that take surveys and, you know, there are definitely strengths and weaknesses in all of them. And I like the way this is laid out uh, and it's going to be very easy for our families to understand and give us lots of information. So uh, definitely good work to you and your team. Um, hats off to everyone and continue putting Kansas on the map. You guys are doing a good job. So that's very good. Thank you. Thank you all so much. Thanks for a great way to start a Friday. Thank you. Yep, absolutely. Next, we will hear from Tara Gregory, who is going to give us an update on the child care assistance study. All right. Hello. Um, thanks for inviting me to share this. Uh, this is some work that um, uh, my center, the Center for Applied Research and Evaluation, I'm, I'm the director of that center at Wichita State, um, we partnered with the Public Policy and Management Center, also at WSU, to um, create and do this survey on behalf of DCF. Um, you know, we we responded to an RFP requesting someone to do some investigation into um, why why so many eligible families are not applying for the child care assistance program. And so we, we received that contract and um, then put together this study. So um, after many months of working on it and um, you know developing the survey and contacting people and that kind of thing, we're really happy to be able to share this. So uh, you can go ahead and move forward. Um, so this is the purpose, investigate why eligible parents may not apply for the DCF child care assistance program, um, as well as way to improve the process for all applicants. And so uh, when we were surveying people, we, we were looking for anyone who, who would be eligible for child care assistance, um, those who have never applied, those who have applied, those who are currently receiving it. And so we wanted to get a broad perspective from um, anyone who has some experience with this or who at least is eligible. Okay, we can go forward. Um, so we, we use two methods, basically. Um, we use the survey of caregivers, and then we also used interviews. So like I said, we developed the survey in collaboration with DCF. So my organization, CARE, and then PPMC, the other uh, department at WSU, um, we worked on the survey and developed questions and um, got approval from DCF to move forward with it. Uh, we administered it online. And um, we actually, we distributed the link through what we call trusted organizations. Many of you probably got the link and sent it out to parents. 
um, or, or, you know, organizations that did that. So we really felt like nobody was going to respond to a survey from, you know, people at WSU that they don't know. We also didn't have a list of um, parents or, or families who were eligible. And so we had to rely on organizations that families already knew and were already connected with in order to distribute the survey. Um, so that was kind of the trusted organization. Each organization that um, distributed the survey got a hundred dollar gift card. So it was, you know, not a lot, but a little bit of a token of appreciation for um, for being involved in this and promoting it. Um, we also gave thirty five dollar gift cards to um, anybody who participated in the survey. Uh, so we allowed one person from each family to participate in the survey, um, and and then they got that gift card. So um, ultimately, we got 770 responses. We had to do a lot of cleaning of the data, and uh, because there was a gift card offered, you know, we got we got a number of responses from people in California or whatever who somehow got the link. Um, but we cleaned out those responses. Um, we did not send them gift cards if they if they weren't eligible. So um, there were a number of eligibility um, screening questions. So they had to have children that lived with them at least part time. Um, they had to meet eligibility requirements and they had to live in Kansas. So those were basically the screeners. And if people didn't answer, you know, uh, affirmatively to at least one of those then they were kicked out of the survey. Um, so anyway, we got 770 valid responses from that. Um, and then um, I'll talk more about uh, the findings of the survey and the interviews as we go through. Um, so we did do follow-up interviews. In the survey, we asked people if they were interested in participating in an interview following the survey and we got about 200, 300 people responding saying, yes, I'm interested in that. We were also offering another $35 gift card. Um, as it turned out, we didn't get many takers on that. We had to really kind of beat the bushes to, um, you know, get six parent interviews and six um, interviews with child related professionals, uh, child care related professionals. Um, after we couldn't get interviews with parents, we decided, okay, let's expand that and talk to people who work with parents and know this population and could give us some insight. So, um, you know, again, we really did a lot of recruitment to try to get people to respond, but they just they just weren't interested in doing the, the interview. Um, but we feel like we got good results from that. Um, we heard the same thing pretty consistently, which told us, okay, we were pretty good with having um, these 12 interviews. Okay, we can go forward. Okay, so really quickly before I get into the spe specifics, the overall findings um, across the interviews and, and the surveys were that um, some people struggle with the application. It's not, it wasn't like a majority, but enough were saying the application's too hard, I don't understand it. Um, it concerns me. The questions are too invasive um, that we felt like, OK, that that's something to um, pay attention to. Lack of awareness of the program. Um, there it, it wasn't that a majority were not aware of the program, but um, they weren't aware of a lot of the details. They were confused about a lot of the details. Um, and so, you know, that was that was one of the things that kind of came through across all of the, both of the methods. Um, transportation is a barrier to access that came up in the survey. And we felt like that was kind of important to um, put in here that um, people may want to take advantage of this, but when they can't get to childcare or they can't find childcare, then that may be limiting how many eligible families are applying. Um, service providers could be helping with recruitment. We, it was interesting to us um, how many service providers we contacted at, who you know, had pretty large networks who said, oh, I've never heard of this program. Um, and so you know, that was a little bit of an eye opener for us that, oh, okay, 
Um, so there are some service providers who, who don't know about it and aren't able then to convey that information to the parents they work with. And then a really big one that came through is there just isn't quality affordable childcare. Um, either there's not enough childcare in the area where I live, particularly in rural areas, or it's not very affordable for me. Um, you know, a lot of a lot of the people, um, or most of them were lower income and just were saying, this is, I'm getting priced out. I can't afford this. Um, we, we put a note in here um, in checking with DCF when we wrote this up, um, some of the responses conveyed that people just don't understand their policies and programs. So there were some things people were saying about, I got kicked off after, you know, six months or uh, providers saying, oh, they kick people off um, suddenly, you know, some of those things that were not really accurate, but that's the perception um, or that, oh, they're going to go after um my child support or that kind of thing that may not really be accurate, but were pretty persistent, um, at least in the in the interviews coming up as reasons why people are a little bit reticent to apply for this program. Okay, go ahead and talk specifically about survey results. So um, just to give you a little bit more of a breakdown of who responded. So we got responses from at least 60 counties across the state. Some people didn't fill out what county um, they, they live in. So, you know, we, it may have been more than that, but at least 60. 75% um, of the respondents said they had applied for child care assistance and 84% were currently receiving benefits. Um, like I said, the vast majority had at least some awareness of the program. A big chunk was kind of in the middle saying, I have a little bit of knowledge of this program, um, but at least at least people had heard of it. Of those who were not aware, we asked them, well, now that you know about it, would you be likely to apply? So 40 42% were likely to apply. Um, we also asked about if... Um, if, if they had had some sort of an issue in the last six months with their child care and 57% said, yes, they had, um, which, you know, they didn't necessarily qualify what kind of an issue, but, um, you know, for one reason or another, they had a problem with child care in the last six months. And again, here's the transportation question. And I will note, we asked a lot of demographic um, questions about, uh, you know, employment, um, uh, you know, uh, their, uh, whether they were married, um, gender, those kinds of things. Um, so I'm presenting a really high level overview of, of the responses. Um, but one of the things we asked was about owning a vehicle. So a pretty large percentage don't own a vehicle. And of those who don't own a vehicle, 63% don't have access to transportation. So again, when you're talking about trying to get kids to childcare, they may wanna take advantage of it, but transportation may be a problem, okay? We can move forward. So we also asked them um, like, what what influenced them in choosing a child care provider? Um, by the way, I don't think I put it in here, but but most of them did have child care. Most of them um, were receiving or, or were using licensed child care. Of those who didn't use licensed child care, it was mainly their family um, who were taking care of children. Um, but when we asked them, what are your top three factors in choosing child care? It was cost, whether the child likes going and whether it's licensed were, were the top three. We also asked them to um, tell us about what they consider too cheap to be quality, um, just about right, too expensive to afford. And um, this is where PPMC really came in because my center doesn't do any kind of economic analysis, but PPMC um, uh, set up these questions and did the analysis. So in asking, um, so, you know, we asked a number of questions to try to narrow down. So what is the optimal price point? And so based on all of these responses, uh, just under $300 per child per week is what they consider um, reasonable that they're probably getting decent quality, but not so expensive that, that it's out of reach. And the range was, you know, about $200 a week 
um, is too cheap that they would be worried about the quality, nearly $500 a week is too expensive that, um, you know, they wouldn't be able to afford it. Okay. Um, so when we asked those who had had um, experience with child care assistance, so I will say they were mostly neutral. However, that was kind of that mid-range answer where um, I think the actual answer was um, basically not negative, not positive. So we gave them kind of that out of, uh, I, it's not great, it's not bad, I'm going to hit here in the middle. That could be indicative of people who really are like, uh, I don't know, I, I, you know, it's it's neither one or the other, or it could have been people who are like, I want to get through this as quickly as possible. Um, we did screen out any responses that um, were too fast. And so we we shouldn't have picked up people who were just kind of Christmas training the, um, you know, or going down the center of their survey to get through as quickly as possible. Um, but we did get a chunk in that middle section where we can't say for sure that 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 they're really kind of um, ambivalent about their experience. But that was always the largest percent. So when we asked more specifically about ease of applying, 44% were in that middle area of not hard, not easy. Um, but 37% were more on the end of easy, very easy. Ease of continuing to stay um, enrolled, 50% said neither hard nor easy. 40% said easy or very easy. And then ease of finding providers. Again, we got a big chunk in the middle, 51%, but 35% were, were on the positive end. So, um, you know, I mean, the good thing about this is that you had a much smaller percentage in the hard, very hard categories, um, but we did have that chunk in the middle that probably a good percentage of them really were kind of ambivalent about, mm, this isn't this isn't the easiest thing, but it's also not the hardest. Um, but you had a decent chunk saying uh, it's not that bad. It's pretty easy. OK. Um, so for those um, who hadn't um, applied before, we asked them what are the reasons why why they believe that. So too many requirements was the number one uh, response and actually you know, you see kind of in the other answers here, the top five, the top answers, um, you know, different variations on that same idea, too many requirements, too many hoops to jump through, the application is too long. So again, these are people who haven't had experience with it, um, or at least not personal experience. Um, and, and this is what they believe about it. Um, and then I haven't been able to get other kinds of assistance. One of the things that we think about some of the comments that may have come through the interview is that people may not understand that the child care assistance program is different than TANF. It's different than, you know, other programs that they may have been getting through DCF or KDADS or, you know, some other organization. Um, and so some of their responses may have kind of had some bleed over from their experience with with other entities. Um, you know, we didn't in the in the survey or in the interviews think to say, you know, do you think that that might have been TANF or, you know, are you receiving other types of assistance? Uh, but in this one, they said they haven't been able to get other kinds of assistance. So they kind of thought, well, I'm not going to get this either. OK. Um, so on this one, I, I forgot to put the scale on here, but the, the dark end is the more positive end. Um, so ease of contacting DCF offices, as well as using the DCF website. So we wanted to figure out, okay, are people just running into issues of, of calling or visiting DCF offices, or do they not understand, is the website unwieldy? And for the most part, again, we got a big chunk right in the middle of, of it's not hard, it's not easy, um, and and more people on the easy, very easy end than on the hard, very hard. So the 
the colors in yellow are the hard, very hard. So, you know, for the most part, um, most people are saying it's, you know, well, they're in the middle, but more people are positive about contacting DCF offices and definitely more people are, are positive about um, using the DCF website than they are negative about it. We did ask um, how comfortable people are with technology. And for the most part, people in this survey said they were comfortable. They didn't have an issue with internet. Um, and so, uh, you know, we looked at that. Maybe that's a barrier that they don't really know how to access um, things online, but it didn't appear to be. They, you know, even, even the people who are a little bit older in the sample um, really didn't indicate that they had a problem with it. Okay. So um, now I'm going to jump to the interview results. Um, again, we interviewed six six parents and then six provider six service professionals who have regular contact with parents who are eligible for um, child care assistance. And so so we got those two perspectives. And one of the things um, we looked to see if there was a difference between the two groups, but really they kind of came together. Um, pretty well, and there wasn't a lot of difference in the kinds of themes they were sharing with us. So um, these are not in any particular order, but the main themes that we identified in, in the interviews was lack of availability of providers. That was a big one. And um, in the report, if you read the report, we acknowledge that DCF can't take care of that alone. That's, that's a problem that is just affecting you know, the state in general affecting um, the nation. And so, you know, that's not something that DCF is going to solve through the uh, child care assistance program. But, you know, they talked about how, why should I apply when I know I, there are providers in my area? Or why should I apply when I know the providers are too expensive? Um, and so that that came up a lot that, you know, I just can't get the care that I need. Um, lack of providers that accept DCF child care assistance. Even um, in talking to some of the professionals, you know, they, they talked about, and they weren't necessarily saying that they um, were providers that accepted DCF child care as assistance, um, but they were talking about their experience of, of hearing from providers that um, it's too difficult to apply. Um, there are too many rules. And this is where we heard some of the, the misinformation about, oh, you know, DCF cuts people off suddenly. And that means my income as a provider is impacted suddenly and I can't operate like that. And so, um, so that was a concern, the, the lack of providers that accept DCF child care assistance. Um, and again, we heard from some of the providers that they have some misinformation about that as well. Or we heard that some of the providers have that misinformation. Extensive and confusing paperwork. Um, one, of the, one of the participants said, the questions are just really intense and it's a lot to fill out. It's a lot to try to figure out. And DCF is nice about saying, do the best you can, but it's still stressful in trying to figure this out. Um, unclear processes and deadlines. This kind of goes back to what some of the, what we were hearing providers were saying about, uh, you know, these families might get cut off at any moment and, you know, we don't know about that. Or uh, one of the things one of them had, had said was, well, you know, DCF makes you renew every 60 days or something like that. Um, and so there's just a lot of misinformation and misunderstanding about processes and deadlines that are impacting the families as well as the providers. Um, inconvenient procedures had to do with, um, you know, one, one parent said, you know, I called and was trying to get enrolled and I was told, hey, if you can show up at the office today, we'll get you enrolled today. And she said, I have a full-time job. I can't get away. I can't do this. Um, or, you know, the, the no one was available to do the um, enrollment in Spanish or, you know, whatever it may be. It, it seemed like there were some issues that impeded people from being able to apply 
um, in a way that was convenient for them. Okay. Stigma and shame, you know, this is the, uh, uh, several of the interviewees said, I don't want to be on welfare. I, I don't want people to know I'm on welfare. And so, you know, that that cuts across, I know, a lot of different um, assistance programs that people might enroll in. So it's not unique to DCF, but that came up um, in the interviews as well. Unpleasant interactions with DCF staff. We got a number of people saying that they'd had good experiences with DCF staff, but um, we had a couple of people comment and say, you know, you're already going and and you're asking for help and sometimes that's embarrassing and you're also overwhelmed as a parent and then when someone doesn't treat you kindly or um, acts like you're inconvenient, then that makes you not want to apply. You know, we all understand you can have a bad day and, and, and everybody's human, um, but the people who were, were responding to this said, you know, it just compounds the, the other reasons that people might not want to apply. Fear of repercussions. Um, we heard from people who talked about um, people worrying it might affect their, um, their child support, that it might affect, um, um, that they, they're worried that they might get turned into authorities for, for some other reason, whether it's immigration status, or something like that, but they just felt like, I'm gonna stay away from this system because I'm concerned about what might happen to me if I engage. And so, um, you know, again, that's, that's something where a little more education about what information is needed might, um, I'm kind of jumping to the next one, the lack of knowledge of the program and criteria, um, a little more, education about what information is required, um, what is how that information is used, and what protections there are for things like, you know, child support or immigration status or things like that might help uh, alleviate some of those some of those fears um, that that we picked up in that fear of repercussions. Um, and just the overall kind of confusion about some of the processes and um, deadlines and, and that kind of thing for both the providers and um, the, the families. Um, so, you know, it all kind of comes down to, I know this is, uh, you know, a, a, a big thing that programs deal with, um, just being able to get the word out. You know, you try and you try and you try to let people know what the facts are and then they still go, you know, well, but, you know, so-and-so told me something different, or I had this experience 10 years ago that's different, and this can't be right. So, you know, we totally understand the the obstacle that it, that is about getting more information out. But some of the things that we, um, you know, pointed out in the report were, you know, helping parents understand the program uh, and, and the criteria you know, what, what they need to provide and why. Also helping providers understand the, the policies and, and some of the deadlines and that kind of thing, um, as well as getting information out to providers so that they can um, really help promote this to the families that they work with. So um, that's it. I tried to be really quick, hopefully. Um, it, any questions? Okay, I see none here. This is really, um, really, really, um, here. This is really interesting in that um, we have a lot of parents uh, who have a lot of the same comments when we talk to them about DCF, especially the child support situation. We have single moms that don't want to apply because they don't have contact with the father and are concerned if all of a sudden they're forced to participate with child support, um, that that's going to open up doors that maybe they aren't as comfortable with. And so it's interesting yeah. to see, you know, that when you're looking at it in the survey form. So uh, interesting. Yeah, they work. definitely, and, and a couple of people just said, I don't want to get, you know, the father 
or the mother in trouble. And, you know, so they're kind of worried about, okay, what are the repercussions for other people as well? So, so yeah. And so what are next steps with the survey results now that um, DCF has these? Do we know any more about next steps? So I feel like, and this is Michelle, <clears throat> I feel like that's probably my place to talk about next steps. Um, so part of the reason that we did this survey is because we don't want to assume that we know what the issues are, right? We want to actually dig a little bit. But to be honest, a lot of the issues that were brought forward were the issues that we're already working on and addressing. So I don't, there wasn't, I mean, to be honest, I don't know that there was anything that was really discovered that we didn't already know. Um, so we just keep working to try and improve the system. We are doing, I don't know if you guys see the commercials or anything, trying to get the word out about child care assistance. So we hadn't really had the funds to do that before we had additional recovery funds. So we have all of that work going on. Um, working closer with partners to help people um, to apply for assistance is one area that we're really focused on. Um, working with our child care providers to know more about child care assistance. Some of the changes, the more recent changes, obviously, we th I think that we're seeing that in these survey results, like that um, people might not be aware of some of the changes. There are like hardly any reasons at all that we would close down a child care program before the renewal period. So once somebody is eligible, they're almost always going to be eligible for a full 12 months of benefits. So that one there is kind of a big one. And a lot of that information and changes that we've made to policy have been from survey results that were included in the market rate survey, which we're working on the market rate survey again. So it's the things that the providers are sharing with us about what keeps them from participation. But I think one of the biggest takeaways from this is the number of people that don't know about child care assistance. That's like one of the biggest takeaways and how much we need to actually keep doing some of these ads we're doing and trying to get the word out. Maritas? This is Maritas. Thank you so much for the information, um, Tara. I do have a question. Would it be possible to get a copy of the survey results or the presentation? There are information here that I was not aware, but one of the questions I would answer the top three factors choosing childcare, I would answer the same way. That was those top three were also my top three. Yeah, I think, um, Lindsay, I, I don't know if, I, I know Lindsay has the, the PowerPoint as well as the um, report, so I'll let you speak to that. And I can drop the link to it in the chat, too. Thank you. Everyone should have uh, either a link to it in their email from me prior to this meeting. And it's also available in the meeting materials on our SharePoint uh, panel SharePoint site, um, but also happy to share again for quick access today. But yeah, it should be readily available uh, for everybody to review. Tanya. Um, I mean, Tara, thanks for sharing this. And, you know, I think Tara said it at the very beginning of her presentation, the best. They relied on the partners to get the information to the families and the providers to just do the survey because families and providers lean on and trust those that they already have the relationship with in order to take the survey. And so, you know, going back to what Nikki said, I wrote notes down of how our teams that are working with providers and working with families can continue to encourage the DCF assistance and get them the correct information out to encourage this because they already have the relationship with the families and the providers. And I think word of mouth is gonna be that 
one of the easiest ways to can get this program used more and get families to trust those that they already have those relationships and providers to trust those that they have the relationship. So um, I think that's one of the ways this group can help. We have those relationships with or, or our organization does with the families and the providers. And like Tara said at the beginning, they had to lean on those individuals in order to even get them to do the surveys because relationships are everything. Thank you, Tanya. Leah. So I, I know you mentioned that there you've been doing, and I've seen some of the commercials and those um, announcements. I just wondered what other avenues, because I know the communication piece and getting the word out, and I agree, word of mouth is how many of our programs um, receive referrals, but is there a greater marketing plan? Um, are you utilizing any kinds of social medias or networks there to help get the word out? So, I mean, right now we're using recovery funds for our marketing plan. So I'll be honest that, I mean, those recovery funds are going away. So I think there are some concerns on whether or not we can continue, but we have an agreement with a marketing company. So yeah, there's, there's, and we're just now starting the marketing campaign that's targeting awareness of child care assistance. So they had been targeting prior to this, trying to get more people um, licensed as providers. And then we looked at trying to get more providers enrolled with DCF. So now we're on to the new phase, which is to try and get people more aware of child care assistance. But yeah, it's a comprehensive marketing plan and, and it is just starting. So, and I don't know if it's something about me, but I get the ads like, everywhere and it's probably somehow I've done something so that they know to target me but I'm seeing them a lot but I've also heard from our federal partners and others that they're seeing a lot of those ads and that information which sends people to child care in Kansas the website to learn more so I don't know if you guys are seeing those ads or anything but that's that marketing campaign and the website ads and all of that. Um, that's what we're doing right now. Any other questions or comments? If none, Tara, thank you for the update on uh, the results of this and the shell. I appreciate you hopping in and, and answering questions, uh, you know, with all of this. And, um, you know, we'll be uh, sharing these results and doing more to be able to um, maybe help dispel some untruths, I guess, you know, with people and do more to be able to get people to, uh, you know, enroll in subsidy. We certainly have the population here. We, we, we serve a lot of children with subsidy within our schools, but, you know, I, we know that there's others that are eligible. And so we just got to be able to kind of break through those, um, you know, their own personal biases or thoughts or, you know, whatnot. And so I'm sure all of us together can figure out a way to, to solve all of that, to be able to get more people um, so that they can receive the benefits that they, that they deserve, uh, you know, that can help them. So, all right. Well, thank you very much again for doing that. Next up, we are going to hear from our work groups. And so first, uh, we will hear from a spokesperson on strategy 4.2 on family-friendly workplaces. Thank you, Cornelia. This is Dana Book. I'm with KCSL, and I will be the spokesperson. I always promise to try to keep this short and then always fail in that process, but I'll try it again. So, and I was listening as as Tara was presenting and then Michelle followed up and this meeting every time we listen to presentations I think oh that fits in with what we do and that's that's really been the gist of our conversation in the last 30 days and we really took a hard look at the original recommendations we had and and have distilled it down to to really you know just one or maybe two um big recommendations for the panel or for the cabinet and and child care is a huge piece of the family friendly workplace work but we've we've really gotten to the point where we have 
some, you know, a couple of recommendations, but then looking at actual strategies, how we, how we get to that and, and really kind of distilling it into three different buckets, outreach, implementation, and then support of the work. And so, so that's where we are now. And I always say, you know, we're going to come back to the big group and, and have an ask. And I would imagine, um, just in mentioning those those three areas, if you think about where your organization would fall into that, whether it's on the front end of family friendly workplace work in in outreach and in education and awareness, or the actual implementation piece or the ongoing support behind doing the survey and getting the data back in from employers and and organizations. So that's where we've landed. Um, but I'm. I'm open to any questions or if any of my team wants to follow up with things that I probably have forgotten in my allergy haze, um, feel free. Perfect. Questions or comments for Dana? Thank you for that update. Next, we will hear from Tactics 7.1.2, which is local zoning and homeowner associations. And that's me today. Um, this is Aldana Chestnut. I'll be giving the report today. Um, so last year, we kind of put our focus pretty much on zoning, and now we're trying to look more at the HOA part this year. So we created a survey um, with the assistance from Johnson County Department of Health and Environment, um, uh, epidemiologist Megan Sparks. And so we had a really good discussion with a lot of back and forth on the content and the wording, et cetera, of the survey. We had a really great discussion mm -hmm. over what we're really trying to get out of it, what we really want to do with this information, et cetera, at our last meeting. And the survey has gone live. Our methodology is that it's going out through um, a link that Tanya Cohen has through Child Care Way of Kansas is promoting it. She's sending it out to all child care providers via their um, listserv, et cetera, to reach providers. Um, our, we're not getting really great uh, numbers yet, so um, ho we're hoping to be able to send it out again. So far, we have 21 total responses and 15 of which were actually complete responses. The remainder were just only answered some of the questions. Um, right now, our sample size is too small to indicate anything with real confidence. And so that's why we're hoping that we can send it out a few more times and try to get some more information. Um, at this time, we really, you know, it seems like our, well, our target population, I should have said that, our target population is in-home providers that are operating within homeowners associations. And part of our discussion was, could we reach out to past providers to see if they had closed because of an HOA? Uh, but Tanya clarified that once providers are no longer doing care, they're removed from the Child Care Aware database. So we don't have a mechanism to reach those at close. So that's why we're only doing current providers that identify they're operating in an HOA or recently uh, that they're still a current provider, but have not... Um, that have had problems with an HOA. Um, so far in our small, small sample, most of our respondents have indicated no barriers experienced from the HOA, um, that there has been those several referring back to their barriers are from the zoning restrictions, which was the first survey we did. Um, so it seems like that from what we're finding mostly so far in our very small sample, that it, it seems more the barriers are zoning related versus HOA related. Um, but the ones that did state they had barriers, they were things like HOA regarding traffic limitations and complaints from neighbors. Another indicated that um, they were required to sign a liability waiver for their HOA and other homeowners since they ran an in-home childcare. And, and yet another said they were required to pay an additional HOA fee for the business, uh, for their business, but were not allowed the additional vote at the HOA. They still just got the one vote, even though they had to pay additional. And those were probably the most extreme of what we've seen so far. So while well, potentially kind of moving forward, we're hoping to 
get more people to respond so that we have a comfort level that it's truly a representative sample um, statewide and that we really can make recommendations around that that currently we don't have. So, um, and then we continue to, on the flip side, we continue to promote um, the toolkit for zoning, um, which seems to be actually be the bigger issue right now. I don't know if anybody else in my group wants to add anything to that. All right, any questions or comments for Eldana? If none, thank you for providing that update. Next, we will hear from the spokesperson of Tactic 6.1.1, which is compensation and benefits. Good morning, Heather Schroeder, the Kansas Head Start Association. Um, we met following the panel meeting last month and continue to explore what we see as the components of competitive compensation for the Kansas Early Childhood Workforce. Um, knowing that there are recommendations forthcoming um, due to the ongoing work with the watershed group and um, recommendations around salaries and wages, we have um, we'll continue to stay engaged in that process, but also have turned our attention to exploring um, what options or avenues are available for increasing employer-provided health insurance coverage um, and or other benefits for the early childhood workforce. So uh, we left our meeting last month with several items to research amongst us. And so that'll be our focus today to come back together and see what everyone found out. If anyone has information to share in that area, certainly reach out to one of us and uh, let us know so we can follow up on it. Anyone want to add anything from that group? Okay, I think that's all. Okay, very good. Questions or comments? None. Thank you, Heather, for the update. Lastly, we'll hear from Tactics 6.1.5, which is recruitment and retention. Hi, Courtney. This is Amy Godshammer with 6.1.5. Um, we are continuing to uh, research our, our options for where we can put together our online tool that would provide the different strategies to address the various uh, recruitment and retention challenges outside of, of compensation and benefits. Um, we've kind of narrowed it down to perhaps um, maybe the All-In for Kansas Kids site or perhaps um, somewhere on the registry. So we're kind of exploring what our options are with that at the moment. Um, I think that's, those are the main things that we're looking for. Um, for now, it, it seems like we kind of just need to set an endpoint because you can, you can keep going down these rabbit holes, coming up with more and more ideas. So we just have to put an endpoint to it and and move forward and put something down on paper or rather up on the web. So that's kind of where we are at the moment, just trying to nail down where this might live so we can actually put the document together and get it live. Very good. Thank you, Amy. Questions or comments? Always good to hear updates from all of the different work groups and conversations that are um, that are happening across, um, you know, our, our our work groups and panels uh, in our panel. Um, in the month of June, um, we have an ask for our work groups, and that is that you prepare a report that's going to will that will a presentation that's going to include either a recommendation, next steps. Anything that would be helpful as we end this year's work group and transition into next year's work groups. Uh, we hope that, um, you know, a lot of our existing panel members will remain, uh, that you all will be here. But you may or may not want to stay on the same um, work group that you're on. Uh, you know, you may get, uh, you know, choose to move to a different work group. And so you want to kind of wrap things up and either have you give recommendations or at least give clarity in terms of next steps and maybe what direction, um, you know, recommendations or whatnot as we move to next year's work group. And so that will actually happen not in our May, but our June meeting. So you have a couple of months to be able to kind of meet and figure out what those next steps should be. Again, just to give some guidance or whatnot for the new work groups as they establish when we begin the new year. Questions about that at all? Okay, if none, thank you again for all of your presentations. 
it is time to apply for uh, the early childhood, um, the Kansas Early Childhood Recommendations Panel. And so if you have not already done so, we are accepting applications through May 3rd. It is a one-year turn from July 1st through June 30th, 2025. Panel members, we do encourage you to reapply. We'd love to continue to have you serve on the panel. And if you have anyone that you can think of that uh, you know you think would be great to serve on the panel that would be interested in the work that we're doing, uh, you know, please share information with them as well. You can visit the Kansas Children's Cabinet and Trust Fund website, kschildrenscabinet.org, to learn more and receive uh, you know see the application that you fill out. It's a pretty easy application, you know, to uh, to complete. Uh, but again, the deadline to submit your application is May 3rd. So drum roll, please, for our bright spots. And so you all were given uh, the heads up that we want you to think about amazing things to be able to share about your, uh, your organizations or communities. And so who would like to go first? Eldana? So I just wanted to share that Raising JOCO had our, uh, which is our new child care coalition, we had our first conference and we had over 100 providers that attended and some absolutely fabulous presentations. It was a really good day. So I was really happy with that. Wanted to share that bright spot. Very good. And congratulations. Mallory? Hi, I'm Mallory Arlano um, and I'm part of the um, Family Friendly Work places um, work group. And um, I'm out here in Southwest Kansas in Garden City. And so I had talked to um, basically the CEO of um, like the economic planning and things for Finney County um, about what we're doing and, and our timeline for presenting this in June. And so they're really on board um, and working with um, the businesses um, in this area so that families are aware of, of those family-friendly workspaces. So just wanted to share that, that they're really excited about that work that we're doing. Very good. Thank you. Karen. So Mitchell County Partnership for Children hosted early childhood educators from five counties. We had about 60 early childhood educators brought together and provided them in-person KDHE training, treated them like the professionals they are. And we were blessed to have Tabitha Rossbury present with us. Very nice, very nice. Thank you. Bronwyn. Good morning. Uh, just a quick update to the early childhood comprehensive survey that we conducted uh, through Kansas Child Care Training Opportunities, of course, with uh, funding through DCF. We had uh, uh, quantitative surveys, you might remember, and also um, conducted focus groups we we're excited to share that we had over 6,000 responses. Um, so we have a pretty fantastic data set that we're working through um, to share with, with everyone um, what, we've, what we've heard from the workforce. More coming. That's an incredible number, right? And so uh, we're going to give you a lot of information. So excited to see the results. Thank you. Any other bright spots? Okay, if none. Um, each month, Ms. Lindsay works hard to come up with exciting items to add to our agenda, information that uh, would be helpful for us, to, for us to know as we continue to serve Kansas children and families. If you have any recommendations of things that can be should be shared, uh, there is an agenda resource form that's available on the panel SharePoint hub. And that's um, that link is always included in the emails that Lindsay sends out. But there is a form there that you can complete if you just want to give her contact information, subject matter, anything like that. You know, she's willing to do the legwork. She's amazing. And, uh, you know, and connecting us to people or whatnot and, and, and pulling together the presentations or whatever needs to happen. But again, if you have agenda ideas or anything like that, we're always open for new options and new ideas. And again, that uh, there is a form for that, the agenda resource form on the panel SharePoint Hub. We um, 
Okay, and she's stating that panel members are always encouraged to reach out if you have discussed uh, discussion based items to add. Perfect. And so we'll have that as well. So again, uh, whether it's stuff that you want to talk about, things, other work groups, et cetera. So please, uh, you know, add to, uh, you know, our list of agenda items because, uh, you know, she works hard to make sure that we have meaningful information that's shared each meeting. And so thank you for that, Ms. Lindsay. Our next meeting is going to be on May 17th at nine o'clock. And the next Kansas Children's Cabinet and Trust Fund meeting is going to be June 7th from nine to 12. And that meeting is live streamed on YouTube. We are going to have a quick 10 minute break so that we can stretch and, um, right, yeah, break next, yes. So that we can stretch, have some coffee, um, you know, recharge our brains, and then we are going to go out into our breakout rooms. You'll come back to the same link and then she'll have rooms available for you uh, to go on ahead and you guys can have your uh, meetings or if you are scheduled to meet at a different time, you know, that's fine as well. But the same link will be open and then we'll have breakout rooms that are available. So we will see you, it is 940. We will, I mean, <laughs> it is 1040 and we will see you at 10.50. So you guys have a great weekend and we'll see you next month.